Well, I too want to welcome all of you to this symposium. Um, I've been looking forward to this and really beginning the Colonel's ideas of this symposium three years ago. So to see you here and to have the first two presentations and to look forward to what's ahead, I'm just I'm thrilled that you're here and, and to be part of this with you. I want to talk uh, a little bit about vision possibilities with uh, research and teaching with the Judy Chicago Art Education Collection. You saw the, um, the incredible journey of, uh, from conceptualizing that there was a collection to asking Judy Chicago, what are you doing with your teaching materials? And that began this whole process with this deed of gift um, that you could see, seven layer cake, the whole bit. It was, um, it was a journey, and, um, but really uh, quickly done in a lot of ways from what I hear with such things. And, and so we have it here, and I have been very um, uh, fortunate to be working with, able to conceptualize and to build programming around what we do with the collection. So what I want to do is, um, is explore in, in my presentation here some possibilities and to explore them with you. And I'll be starting with some, um, some of the things that have happened and also what I would say is an infrastructure, infrastructure to um, set things in motion. I like to set things in motion. I, I'd like to begin by actually showing you what it is and how to access it, um, the, the collection. So it'll come up here. And um, so fortunate to have that endowment to support a graduate student to help build the incredible um, infrastructure and design of the collection website, which becomes a portal, a portal that lives and grows. And, uh, and with that, um, I want to particularly thank, and I would like you to know, that Yenju Lin, who has greeted you this morning, on the table right out, of, out here, look for her name tag, she is the guru behind the um, infrastructure on here and the problem solving and the, and I always say, things beyond what technology can possibly do. And I have these ideas and if I didn't have someone like Yen, Yen to help me, it wouldn't have, have happened. So there's um, a lot of things here that um, I'm going to briefly show you and that also talks, tells us how this, um, how we can have um, vision with the collection, how the collection is a living archive and a living curriculum. By that, living, the idea of living is it's generative. It lives, it builds, and so as Jackie really helped us to see, is like it's not just these boxes that come in and there they are. First, more boxes grow because of the stuff that, that happens, but also in the happening, in the happening of research and teaching, that produces more ways of looking at the items that we already have in the collection. So these are the, some of the ways why we use the word living. It's generative, it builds, it grows, and the kind of programming that I've worked with is a kind of programming that builds collaborations. The kind of collaborations that you mentioned um, with between institutions, the collaborations also are between programs and disciplines and grade levels, uh, collaborations um, that we can envision, that you might be able to envision from some of the things you'll see today that I haven't, haven't thought about. I'm going to begin with introducing, we'll go right to the About page. And on the About page, Judy Chicago actually introduces the archive. And so um, I think we'll ha I think the sound is working. That was one of the things. So, so I'm going to click on this. So this site is very multimedia. There's a whole Judy Chicago channel. We call it the Chicago channel. You'll also see a, an offline version of that at the Palmer. So let's see if we can have Judy inter introduce the archive, a little, little two-minute clip here. I 
said it was probably the closest thing to a religious experience I ever had. <laughs> People come from all over the world to see it. And so I think that that attests to its ongoing relevance. Is that an M or a W? M, like mother? Millennium. Millennium? Okay. In the, so, in the 70s, we all thought there was going to be equality by the millennium. Yeah. And I'm like, oh well, try the next millennium, maybe. I certainly am not finished with the project of introducing it to art educators so that it can have a long life and generations of young people can grow up with the idea that women's history is a normal part of human history. I'm so thrilled about my art education archive going to Penn State and being integrated into their curriculum, into their programs, into their online masters. And this is, of course, the famous sheet closet. It's something that we women have not had enough of seeing our ideas transmitted through institutions to the future. So that's um, thinking about the a Abigail Adams quote. This is is not common um, in institutions, whether they're universities, uh, uh, museums. The, the erasure or the um, non-valuing, non-collecting of um, well, not even the identity of women's names, but also their their work. And so this is like really important part of the, there's vision right there. There's vision that Judy has had, Judy Chicago has had, in, um, in saving, her, saving work, uh, having things documented, going way back. So there's, there's a vision in the, in the past that is helping us in the future. If, that, if those materials were not saved um, and, and, um, and collected and preserved in some way until they could find a home, an institutional home, we would not be able to do anything in the future. We would lose our sense of um, a feminist art, feminist art education um, without the um, foresight of Judy Chicago. Um, because places where she has taught at Cal Arts and such, there is no archive. You would think that there would be, but there isn't. So this is like really, this is where the first vision happens is just the possible, just the collecting, just the preserving. But then to get the agreement with an institution to have it saved in, perpetu in perpetuity. So we've got the boxes here, and when you have um, your, the workshop later this afternoon or during the lunch break, if you'd like, um, the boxes are unpacked. Those crates there are unpacked. And within those particular crates are um, a 112 scale replica of one of the teaching projects in Kentucky in 2001 and 2002 was the exhibition at, at, it's called At Home in Kentucky. It's a revisit 30 years later from Woman House and these, what it, when you, you'll see these displays, it's this like miniature house but it's one twelfth um, uh, scale and everything, all the artwork, all the details from the rape garage to the prejudice, ba prejudice basement to the eating disorder bathroom, all these tiny little pieces within there, you can really see this as uh, if you could think of yourself as small and going into this house and seeing it in a very different way, a very different kind of experience than photographs. And, and also uh, going in there actual. But since many of us in the future will not be able to actually go into that because these projects happen with a certain time period and then they're, they're gone. You can't go see that artwork again. They're not in a museum. So that, that scale model of the at home project is um, an experience, a way of knowing, a potential for research um, that you could not have otherwise. But you know what? There is no 
scale model of Woman House. This here that we have here, why not a group of people developing a grant to get together to, to do the research? We have people that have skills in creating this miniature. Why not from the documentation in this collection um, of Woman House and 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 this collection broadens out to collect to connect to other collections as Jackie has mentioned and also um, it connects to other books and texts that tell us about um, what happened in Fresno Feminist Art Program and Women House. Why not re rebuild that and create that as um, a space, a space, a physical miniature space in which to revisit um, the experiences at Woman House. So I put that out. Um, this is recorded, so it's going to reach a large number of people because, like I said, everything that we do here then becomes part of the archives, gets digitized, and eventually puts, uh, is put up on the internet. So what I'm speaking to is you here, but really the whole world. And that's a vision in and of itself, right? Yeah. OK, so now. This image is to remind me of another vision that happens with this collection. And while Judy was selecting works, images from the slides from her teaching projects for her book that has just hot off the press um, this month, Institutional Time, a studio crit critique of a, a, a critique of studio pedagogy. And she was finding images for the book. I was fortunate to be there, and Judy is so kind, she let me record all the questions I kept asking. And, um, and so we have a recording of Judy talking about the slides, the images. That's an incredible piece of, of information that is recorded. It's now been transcribed. It's in our collection. That's a, that's a, a, a history captured in life. Uh, captured, recorded, and so much more potential with what you can, you know, the, the physical materials here, what we can do with that. As I mentioned, there's links to the off-site um, um, feminist art education. So with the graduate student endowment, it allows us to have assistantships to help find um, sites and sources and um, this, this whole page here, this all, you see how it says about news and then feminist. So this feminist page here is really all connected to off-site connections there um, that allows to contextualize this feminist art pedagogy, Judy Chicago's feminist art pedagogy, this collection here, in a, a, a broader picture. That research is just continuing. Um, part of it is because this website has a comment feature we tag the um, items that come into here by the tags that people suggest. So tags are a way to do searches. So the language for searching is based on the, the people who use the collection, who want to use the collection. That is such a, a different way than in the past. We had Library of Congress. They had a set vocabulary, which is very problematic for any feminist work really problematic. So you have, you know, like even if you use the word teenager and the, the Library of Congress would say adolescent, you would have to go to another book, find out what the language was to try to translate it, and usually the language you use isn't even there, especially for feminist um, researchers and feminist um, artists. So the idea of tagging, the idea of comments, these are ways, these are, are ways to um, the curriculum and the archive lives. Um, it's also, um, I, I say, I feel it's, it's a, a vision that we have not seen with archives. Archives at Penn State and elsewhere, they kind of come in and they have a finding aid and you go and you find these things and there's not this kind of intricate website portal to the collection that allows all of you, everyone, to be able to come in there and um, and add tags to it, and this, uh, and and we're getting better and better at how to do that. And tagging is is such an important feminist concept because the idea, just when uh, like Jackie was describing about the idea of naming oneself, the use of um, 
having your own vocabulary um, and not using most of our language is a patriarchal language. It's, it does not allow for um, the kind of openings that Graham had uh, talked about. So tagging is a, is a, is a way to really um, push what we know, see things and rethink things and say things differently. And there are, our searches go along with that then. Um, here's the living part. I have the arrow, the living archive, living curriculum, and I described how it's a very, very generative. And within this, we have the dinner party curriculum project. Now that we will hear uh, right after me, uh, Marilyn Stewart will be talking about uh, what this is and how um, it has been developed as a, a website accessible throughout the world. And, um, and with that, it needed a place to um, be preserved in perpetuity. And that is a brave thing to say in perpetuity because of the technology changes. And a place like Penn State with all the research and technological support, um, this is a good place, if any place, to assure, ensure that as the, the migration from one device and technology to another to preserve this. So we are very fortunate. Uh, Marilyn will be, um, and her team, she'll be talking about how it was developed. And, um, and, and we are fortunate to, to, to be the, the place to be able to make sure that it's saved into the future and can be used through the f future and accessible into the future. The participatory art pedagogy, I'll tell you a little bit more about that after lunch. And that is um, um, really derived from a, a study of Judy Chicago's teaching methodology um, that I began um, in earnest in 2000, but it really goes way back to the 70s. And, uh, and so, the, in it, but it became in, in connection with um, really looking at what Judy Chicago was doing with envisioning the future at Pomona Art Colony um, in, in 2003. So it, it's a, um, a multimedia overview of Judy Chicago's teaching methodology. This has been used to, um, to create um, programs um, throughout um, every, a lot of different places. I've used it, other people have used it, and there is um, an an award for using the collection in teaching, and it's called the Judy Chicago Education Art Education Award. And um, we will also be presenting um, this award after lunch. And um, it involves using the uh, any part of the collection, the dinner party curriculum project, using the participatory art pedagogy, and other resources um, within this this collection. Out of here is um, I'm going to show a few images of using the participatory art pedagogy in a class that I um, taught this uh, spring. And it's based in Judy Chicago's pedagogy. I was um, fortunate to be able to teach with Nancy Yodelman, who we will also be hearing um, soon today. And Nancy is, uh, um, a, was a student at Judy Chicago, participated in the feminist feminist art program in Fresno, as well as Woman House. So we will be hearing much more from you about that. But we are fortunate to have um, these teaching conversations. You see the image down there of um, I pulled together and invited people throughout campus from um, Susan Russell from theater, uh, Eileen Trouth, she's from information science technology. She said, oh, this collection um, and, and the pedagogy itself made a whole lot of sense. In science, they do problem-based learning. So it made sense that the, the participatory art pedagogy made sense to what they do in the sciences. Who would think that? And so that's another way, another vision, stretching out like that. Um, uh, Marilyn will be telling us more about that, but we have um, all the downloadable um, uh, encounters and um, things are accessible here. Um, I'll be talking more about this after lunch, about the pedagogy and the, um, come back to that, the award. And I'm saying this now so that you might think February 1st is the deadline for the um, submission. So as you start to explore this, this is also my vision, is that we, as we have more and more um, 
people using the collection that these um, examples, award-winning from the field works. Um, we've already put a lot up there, but we will continue to add to the collection from those that are using, um, uh, using the collection. Um, in the teaching conversations, um, for example, Susan Russell from theater and working with her teaching assistant, um, Cassie Bly. Um, this is an example, uh, gives you an example of a vision of using this collection that you may not have thought of. I had not thought of it. Um, uh, Cassie says, after watching how Judy Chicago worked with students to present their problems and concerns as art, students discussed their own fears with creating a response to such controversial material. That controversial material often comes up with um, when you do the, pedag the pedagogical process of Judy Chicago. Chicago's videos encourage Russell students to create performance art from their concerns surrounding the Sandusky scandal. So here, the Judy Chicago collection became that place of how to deal with this tragedy, with this scandal, with all the range of feelings people had dealing with the Sandusky scandal. That's, that's a vision of what this can, can happen here. Another vision is using the, um, the, the collection for these podcasts. And here's podcasts from uh, various speakers working um, at, in the, or at the Palmer Museum of Art um, talking about Judy's work, and they are now part of the collection. We have the Chicago Channel. This is thanks to the library for digitizing it and Yen for figuring out how to um, make it accessible and, 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 um, and just it's, so, it's such an intuitive kind of interface. It's wonderful. We have the Facebook site and um, with young students, they interest us to, uh, to introduce us to Twitter. So we have a whole tweeting conversation or Twitter conversation going on. And, and Facebook too reaches a lot of, lot of people. Um, we have the opportunity with the Palmer Museum um, exhibition and the podcast to see, and this is another whole area of research, is how Judy Chicago's art pedagogy um, helped, uh, well, we can, we can come to the research in, any, in various ways, but one way is to look at how the pedagogy influenced some of the ways that Judy went about working on her art, but particularly her large-scale collaborative works. These are directions. Now, just now, the book is out, Institutional Time. And with that, it gives us a context that we can use when we explore the collection, whether online or in the boxes. So we will be hearing much more about that later today. Here's a few images I'm going to close with of the Out of Here exhibition. So I use the Judy Chicago methodology called participatory art pedagogy. We created participatory art, this is going to be hard to say, and, um, and we did participatory performances. And here it's sort of like the um, um, a, a greeting kind of beginning here in which we were looking at uh, Bill Viola's uh, video of the greeting and we used that to think about uh, how to begin our performance and um, welcoming, greeting. Um, the, the participatory part has to do with we have QR codes that take you to um, a variety of places including um, uh, a, feminist his, a, his, a feminist history map of a uh, a comfort woman in Korea that takes, um, it's a map of her life and it comes up with the images of her work. So within the, so this now, this is showing the expansion from the pedagogy itself that's in the teaching materials to using it to an exhibition, to an exhibition that takes us out into an interactive kind of interface and people can add to it. She uses Google Maps and tells us the life story of, the, of a comfort woman. And then we have the selfies that get uh, put up to Instagram and, and all this kind of stuff. And this is a place to build your confidence and an incredible work of art. We're going to see that later this afternoon. A um, few images here. And I'm looking to uh, just finish up here to just show you the images of some of the interactivity of the participatory performance. These are some visions for um, the Judy Chicago Art Education Collection here. And um, we make sound, and there's an anvil, and we invited people up there. We actually had rhythms of a making um, sound, and I think that the, um, the, the collection itself is um, roaring loud um, to the world. And I will end with that. Thank you. <laughs>